So one of the advantages, I think, of um, lockdown that a lot of people have been saying is that it gives you a chance to, to properly um, appreciate nature. And when you only are allowed to go out for your daily bit of exercise once, you suddenly feel like you have to go out. And so, so off you go. And it's been, um, it's, been, it's been wonderful. And therefore, I think it's a great time for us to be looking at Psalm 19, where, among other things, one of the things we learn to do is not to appreciate nature, but to look through nature to appreciate the God who, who made it all. Um, and um, we've, we've, been, we've been seeing Psalm 19, um, this first half, learning to appreciate God um, through the world that he's made. And then the second half of the psalm, learning to appreciate God through the word um, that he has given. And we do need both to um, borrow a James Bond title the, the world is not enough. It leaves us in little doubt that God is there and that he is magnificent, but it doesn't actually tell us what he's like, which is why God has given us both the world around, but also his word, this specific revelation of what he is like. And Here's the brilliance of having both. You see, now as a, as a Christian with God's world in one hand and God's word in the other hand, when you appreciate a, um, a kind of sunset or a dandelion or a swallow, you can see behind it not just a force or a power or some kind of mystical creative source, But you can see behind all these wonderful things, actually the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is rich in love, abounding in faithfulness. And so with Bibles in one hand and God's world in the other hand, the world around us lights up as we see the glory of the God who we are actually getting to know in the word. Now, with that in mind, we're going to zoom in here today and um, focus in on learning to appreciate God in the world that he has given us. And we're going to do that by by just answering three very uh, simple and brief questions. Here's the first one. What is the purpose of creation? We'll have a look at it here. The purpose is a, a declaration or a proclamation, or a revelation, or a voicing out of one thing, the glory of God. The heavens declare, proclaim, reveal, the voice goes out, and the one big message, the glory of God. And creation drums that message out constantly. Do you see there, day after day, night after night. It's constant. Okay, it does it wordlessly. They have no speech. They use no words. It does it visually. So it's wordless. And it does this universally. Their voice goes out to all the earth. Their words to the ends of the earth. It's a big megaphone to the whole world that is constantly turned on and its message is this there is a god and he is glorious isn't it amazing by the way i love here day by day day after day night after night i don't know if you've thought about this before but by night our eyes are blinded to the world around us but they are opened to the universe beyond us just as by day our eyes are open to the world, but actually closed to the universe. So God has set it up so that nighttime reveals one set of glorious things, daytime reveals another set of glorious things. I mean, what a setup, what a God. Johannes Kepler, 16th century astronomer, um, put it like this as he studied the world. He said, I was merely thinking God's thoughts 
after him. So what's the purpose of, of creation? Why did God create such variety? Well, so that we might know his infinite wisdom. Why did God create uh, such heart aching beauty so that we might see his infinite beauty? Why did God create a billion stars? Well, what better way to show us how big and vast he is? Here's how the Apostle Paul puts it in Romans 1. Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. So friends, as you go for your daily bit of exercise today, everything you see is a megaphone declaring the glory of God. So that's the first question. Here's the second though. What is the reality of our hearts? Well, here's how the Apostle Paul continues in uh, the book of Romans. Okay, God has made himself known in the creation so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile. Now, this is the tragedy of humanity that although God's megaphone is constantly blaring out in the creation, his glory and his goodness, our ears are stuffed. We do not hear it. And in fact, there's a willfulness. We choose not to hear it. In fact, sinful human nature is uh, to become worshippers of creation rather than the creator. Now, Christians have been redeemed by Jesus, but that continues to be the tendency of our sinful hearts, which is why it's so easy for us to marvel at creation and yet give not a thought to the one who made it. That's the reality of the, the, the human heart, which is why this final question becomes one really worth thinking about and engaging with. So how can I grow in appreciating God in his creation. And this is where the second part of this psalm comes in. You see here, we have what I call the principle. This is, this is the big idea, what God does through his creation, declaring his glory. But then, do you see what he does? We get a, a worked example. As he takes one specific aspect of God's creation and and meditates on it. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. This is what he chooses as his theme. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run its course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived from its warmth. So here's what he does. He takes one part of God's creation, the sun. He puts God at the heart of it. And then he meditates. And if, if you want this general principle to actually take root in your heart and to daily glorify not creation, but the God who made everything and appreciate him more in the world that he has made. Well, listen, we need to do the same thing. OK, take anything within God's wonderful creation, bring God into it, meditate on it and thank God for all that he has made. He did it with the sun, but look, we can do it with any, anything. We live in Henley, do it with the river. I mean, there is this water flowing from God. Isn't water an amazing thing, by the way? It, it, it sustains our life and yet kids splash around in it on the beach as well. And, and what a God to create such variety. It turns into snow and you can ski down mountains on it. I mean, it's amazing. Thank you, God. A simple tree. I mean, here we are in spring and the blossoms out. It looks beautiful. But then think about the roots, the way God has perfectly made it to, to, to not only provide stability, but also to bring all the nutrients that it needs. The cycle of, of summer, then autumn, then winter, then spring again. Or a woodlouse. Almost as if they're, they're perfectly designed to fascinate children. And there he is with his little armor-plated back and, and so small and yet so beautifully 
sculpted as he kind of scurries around and we just say thank you god so much variety within your creation do you see the here's the principle but if we want to get it in our hearts we have to do what the psalmist did we have to take one aspect of his creation bring god into it and then meditate on it and thank him for that can i say if you've got kids do it with your kids all the time isn't god amazing to have done that to have made that you see here's the big thing the heavens declare the glory not of the heavens but of god the skies proclaim not the glory of the skies but the work of his hands and say glorify him yourself today let me pray as we close father we thank you for the glory of creation and we thank you that ultimately that points through the world to your glory. And we pray that today we might grow to appreciate you more uh, through the world that you have made. And we pray that for Jesus' sake. Amen.